Jesus is a happy guy. I believe that. He's a joy, joy-filled individual. And uh, he loves to serve the Father, and he loves to serve his people. Uh, he's full of joy. And he always wants us to make... I, I believe he always desires to make us look better. And we're better than we are, than we think we are many times, but he always desires to make us look better. And he never gives up. And like the little boy was watching his mother putting cream on her face and putting it all over. And he said, why are you doing that? She said, oh, I'm trying to look beautiful. And he watched it for a while. And then she's, he's seen her taking it all off. And he says, what, are you giving up? <laughs> Jesus never gives up. Jesus never gives up on you. I'm so glad he never gives up on me. Oh, my. I'm so glad he doesn't give up on me. And other people haven't given up on me either. We all have somebody around us to say, we haven't give up on, given up on you. No matter what you're going through, we're with you. We haven't given up on you. We're going with you. We're going to believe God with you, that things are going to shift and change. Things are going to get better. Holy Father, I thank you this morning for the wonderful privilege to look into your word. Your word that is powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing asunder soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Father, I thank you that your word is so powerful and it releases life to us. And God, as we look into it today, we thank you for faith to believe your word, Father. We thank you that we are believers and that we believe your word. We thank you that as we receive it today, God, life flows through us in Jesus' name. Say this with me, Heavenly Father. I receive your word now, and as I hear your word, life comes forth in me now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, I want to <coughs> mention a couple of things this morning that I want to talk about. One is I want to talk a little bit about the mark of the beast. Why would you talk about that subject, Pastor Bill? Well, there's a lot of talk around that today. There's a number of people I've been talking to, and it, that seems to come up. And I want to talk about that a little bit. But uh, we're going to touch on the book of Revelation just a little bit. But many times when people read the book of Revelation, we know that that, that book talks about the end times or the uh, uh, when things are all wrapped up and Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom and all that kind of stuff. And it talks, there's a lot of, of destruction in, in that book. There's a lot of judgment that falls. Uh, but most people ha seem to miss what it's really all about. Because the book of Revelation is the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation of the beast. It's not the revelation of judgment. It's, the, it's a revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting this morning because I didn't know what songs that the worship team we're going to sing. Did a great job, team. Bless you. We sure appreciate you. But when they sang, uh, Jesus be revealed. And that's what the book of Revelation is about. It's about Jesus being revealed, uh, about who he is. But there's some things in there that we, we want to look at. And it talks about a mark. And I'm going to, we're going to look in the scripture a little bit this morning and see what uh, the mark means, this mark of the beast. This uh, known as 666, we're going to, going to look at that just a little bit because one thing that the body of Christ should never be caught in is fear. And we don't want, we want to decimate any kind of fear that the body of Christ might be walking in. And so we're going to start off in the book of Ezekiel, actually, this morning, Ezekiel chapter 9. Ezekiel chapter 9 is a, is a, is a chapter where well, it's, there's some judgment in there, but there's also uh, some grace and so forth. But in Ezekiel chapter 9, the Lord sees what's happening in uh, Jerusalem, and he knows that judgment has, has to fall. Do you know that? In this world, even when it goes to a certain path and goes through certain directions, there comes a time where God says judgment has to come. It just can't continue on 
judgment has to come because it would be uh, more harmful even for mankind if judge, judgment didn't come, if you just let it go on. So God in his grace at times brings judgment. But I want us to look at a mark that was given in the book of Ezekiel. And it says in verse 3, Now the glory of the God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he called to the man clothed with linen who had an ink, a writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done in the, within it. Put a mark on those who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done in Israel. Now, I, I want you to notice something in that verse where he says, put a mark on people who are doing something. The mark will not cause them to do something. The mark, they're marking them because they are doing something. He's marking them because they sigh and cry over all the abominations that were done in the nation, uh, in the city of Jerusalem. And God will mark us from time to time. He will cause us or he will set us aside and mark us for a specific task. Actually, this particular scripture, uh, I had a, a really quite an experience with it many years ago uh, when the uh, Lord uh, placed a mark on me concerning uh, what his desire was for me. In fact, uh, one, one particular weekend, uh, Debbie and I were going with some friends over to Nova Scotia for a visit just, just for the weekend. And we ended up at a church service uh, there on, on uh, Sunday morning. And the, the man, uh, God had been dealing with me about this particular scripture in, uh, in Ezekiel chapter 9. I've been reading it over and over and over and over again. I said, Lord, what are you saying in this scripture? If you read the whole thing, it's, uh, it, you kind of ask some questions. Uh, Lord, what are you saying in all this? And when, we, when I sat down on that particular morning, when the preacher started talking, he said, well, he said, a number of scriptures I want you to talk about today. I said, I, I want us to turn to the book of Ezekiel. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if he, if he talked about uh, Ezekiel chapter 9? But he didn't. He went to another scripture. And then he talked a, a bit about, uh, I forget what other things he was talking about, but then he went to another scripture and he went to another scripture. And, and as he was talking, the Holy Spirit was stirring in my heart. And he was saying, pay attention. I've got something for you here. And then just before the minister closed his sermon time, he said, let's turn to one more scripture in Ezekiel chapter 9. And he turned to that scripture and he talked a little bit about it. And then he said, I don't know who you are, but there's somebody in this place this morning. You may not even be a part of this church. Maybe you're just visiting here for the weekend. Those are exact words that he said. And he said, I don't know who you are, but God, he reached out and he said, God is putting a mark on you now. And uh, he said a, a couple other things. But when he did, the presence of God just fell upon me. And uh, the, the Lord just opened my spirit to some things that I hadn't really uh, seen before. And uh, after that, there was a new level of intercession and prayer that came into my life. Uh, in this particular scripture in Ezekiel chapter 9, they're talking about intercessors. They cry and sigh over all the abominations that are done on the earth. Really talking about prayer and intercession. And so God marked me uh, for that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've thought of that many times over the years. And I know that God has helped me to pray in, in ways that I normally wouldn't have before. So God does mark us from time to time. But notice now in this particular situation, the seal didn't make these people cry and sigh over the abominations of, uh, in, in Jerusalem. They were marked because that's what they did. Keep that in mind. Now let's go to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. The Apostle Paul here is talking about the church. In him you, that is the church, those believers who trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed is another word for Mark. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now notice there again. Now, it, they, they weren't sealed to make them become believers. They were sealed because they were believers. That's important as we go forward to realize that the seal comes because of what 
they already were. Believers are sealed. Believers are sealed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, actually, John, uh, pardon me, the, yeah, the Apostle John said in John chapter 14, Jesus said that he will ask the Father and he will send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. So the Holy Spirit, in, in that context, the world can't receive him, so they were sealed because they were believers. They weren't of the world anymore. They, re, they had become believers, so they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So the, the seal did not make them believers, but they were sealed because they were believers. They were believers. Now let's go to the book of Revelation. And here we'll see another. We're talking about being marked for God today. And uh, whenever you have a, whenever you have a legitimacy, when you have legitimate money, there's usually always a counterfeit. Somebody will try to bring forth a counterfeit. You have money that's real money and the government is backing it, and then you have people who will try to counterfeit the real thing. But the counterfeit does not take away from the real thing. And one of the things that uh, apparently that people who are looking at finances, looking at money, seeing if it's counterfeit, what they study is the real thing. And if they see anything different, then they realize that it's counterfeit. And there, is, there are some things in the scripture that show us that believers are marked for God. And the enemy will try to counterfeit that as well. In that Revelation chapter 7, verse 2, we'll see another mark. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to, to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees until we have sealed the servants of God on their foreheads. And so here there's another group of people who are getting sealed. And there were 12,000 from each tribe in the nation of Israel. And there was 12 tribes in Israel. So that was 144,000 Israelites that were sealed. And uh, I know the uh, Jehovah Witness kind of claim that, that that's them. But that, the Bible has no bearing uh, concerning that, that being uh, what we refer to as the religious group of Jehovah Witnesses. This is... Uh, sealing the 12 tribes of Israel, and they were sealed. The seal did not make them become a tribe of Israel. They were sealed because they were servants of the living God. They were sealed because they were already involved in serving the living God. Now, I want you to listen close, because this is all going to tie together in a moment here concerning uh, the seal that we want to be a part of. There's some seals we want to be a part of. There's marks that we don't want to be a part of whatsoever. And so here the, the 12 tribes of Israel were sealed. Now we'll go to Revelation chapter 13, and that Revelation chapter 13 is the, the chapter that talks about the mark of the beast. Now just to give you a little, uh, a little bit of background, uh, in the previous verses we, there's a, a beast that is revealed, and he really he is the the incarnation, if you will, of Satan himself. And he sets himself up as God. And then later on, there's another beast that comes and onto the, the scene, and he does everything to, you know, to fortify the first beast and to make him look good. And from there, we move on to uh, the mark of, mark of the beast in Revelation 13. So verse 11 says, Then I saw another wild beast coming up from the ground. It had two horns like a ram, but it spoke like a dragon. And in other words, it was very deceptive. It was very deceptive. It came like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It operated in the authority of the first beast on its behalf, causing the earth and its inhabitants to worship the first beast, whose mortal wound had been healed. Now, the first beast, was uh, had a mortal wound. Some believe it was something, an injury to the head and that, that it actually killed him and that he was raised up again. But he, he was a, a devil nonetheless. 
It operated in all the authority of the first beast on its behalf, causing the earth and its inhabitants to worship the first beast whose mortal wound had been healed. It performed great mirac miraculous signs, even publicly causing fire to fall out of heaven to the earth. And through these startling miracles that he performed on behalf of the first beef, beast, he deceived the world. So it was because of these miracles that were taking place, awesome miracles that were taking place, that he deceived the world. Fire coming down from heaven. You know, we can remember reading in the book of uh, First Kings uh, how Elijah called down fire from heaven and burnt up the sacrifice. That wasn't just a cute story. That actually happened. The fire came down from heaven, burnt up the sacrifice. Well, that's a pretty powerful, miraculous sign. And uh, there's a lot of people who will get caught up in the deception that that, that that brings. But it was this miraculous sign that caused the deception. There'll be no, uh, there won't be people doubting what's right and what's wrong. There's going to be some real strong, miraculous signs that are going to come to deceive the world. Through these startling, miraculous signs he performed on behalf of the first beast, he, beef, he, beast, he deceived the world, telling the people to erect a statue in the image of the beast that had been wounded by the sword and yet lived. The beast from the earth was empowered to breathe life into the image of the first beast, beast so that it could speak and kill those who refused to worship the beast. Say, I refuse to worship the beast. Yeah, you don't want to worship the beast. It also caused everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and bound, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead. This meant no one could buy or sell unless they had the mark that is the name of the beast and the number of its name. As we were continue on, we see that the number that they're talking about is the number 666. Now, I want you to notice here in this scripture, these people were marked. It was the worshipers of the beast that were marked. It wasn't people who were questioning. It was people who had given themselves to worship the beast. Those were the ones who had the mark of the beast. Now, the word mark there, uh, some people say, think it's not a visible mark. It, it may be a spiritual mark, like, the, like in the book of Ezekiel, where we just read, and the Lord said, go and mark this, those who sigh and cry over the city of Jerusalem, the abominations that were done there. I believe that was simply a, a spiritual mark, and the Holy Spirit has marked us. It is a spiritual mark. But when we see this mark, the, the actual Greek word pretty clearly states that, that it's something that uh, may be very visible, and it is a, a mark that's put on those who worship the Antichrist or the beast. And it is, is not something that, uh, that's used in order to try to deceive people. The mark isn't used to deceive people. The mark is used to mark off those who belong to the enemy, those who worship the beast. The mark is there for a reason. The mark actually indicates who you belong to. You either have the seal of the Holy Spirit or you have the mark of the beast. The mark indicates who you belong to. Uh, and that uh, another word that you might use for mark is the word brand. You know, when you brand something, uh, many years ago when I was uh, in Western Canada, I was helping a, a neighbor uh, brand cattle. And we were, we were branding, uh, doing, doing that for the morning. And we were branding the rancher that I worked with, his cattle. We couldn't go over next door to the next rancher and brand their cattle. We only could brand the cattle that belonged to the guy I was working with. And that designated, that brand designated that those cattle belonged to him. Nobody else. And this is what the seal of the Holy Spirit is all about. And this is what the mark of the beast is about. It indicates who you belong to. The mark of the beast, anybody gets that? The Bible says that they belong to the enemy. They are worshipers of the beast. Those who refuse to take the mark, they are of God. And they're not caught up and they're not, they're not going to end up where those who take the mark of the beast. Now, this should help us to understand that 
I'm going to have to set this aside. No disrespect intended. <clears throat> the, uh, yes, the, the, mark, the mark of the beast indicates who you belong to. Now, when we come here this morning and we worship the Lord Jesus Christ, we worship him. It's obviously that Jesus is, is exalted in our midst. We worship him. In other words, we're saying we have, will have allow the enemy to have no part whatsoever in our lives. We refuse to worship the enemy. Now, if we were to, it's really difficult to try to get across to us all the significant things that, that are going to take place in the end season. But I'm really convinced that when this mark of the beast does come on the scene, that it's very possible none of us will be here. Because if you read in, in uh, first Corinth, or pardon me, first Thessalonians chapter 4, you will find out that there's going to come a day when the Lord will come with the shout of an archangel, with the upward call of God, with the trumpet of God, and he will call us out of this place. The Bible says that we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that day. Uh, and if I'm not here when that happens, then I'll, have, I'll already be up, be up there. And I'll actually be coming with him in the clouds when he gives that great, awesome shout and says, come up here. And the Bible says, the Bible actually says, the dead in Christ will rise first. And then after that, we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Glory to God. That is a glorious thought. And I've said many, many times, the better reflection that we have of heaven, the better concept that we, are, we have of heaven, the better we'll live down here. Because we know we have a future that is glorious. We know we have a future that is apart from all the destructions uh, and the lying and the thieving and all kinds of things that are taken upon, the, upon this earth. No, we'll be in a place called heaven, a glorious place where none of these things will take place. Glory to God. Well, you might, you, might be happy, you might be wondering, you know, when you look at the mark of the beast and the worshipers of the beast and those who give themselves to the beast, you might wonder, what's happened to them? What is going to happen to them? In Revelation 20.10, it tells us very clearly, the devil who deceived the masses of people were cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. So they're both going to be in the fire in the lake of fire, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. You see, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I think, I want the mark of God upon me because I want to go to who I belong to. I don't want to end up with the, with the other fella. You know, and it doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, the Holy Spirit loves us so much. He desires us to be with him. And he wants us to be marked right while we're down here. It's all about who we declare that we belong to. It's always been about that, who we belong to. When the prophet Daniel was told that if he was to pray to anybody else except the king for the next 30 days, he would be thrown into the lion's den. Daniel was used to going home every day. Three times a day, he would kneel down and pray toward Jerusalem. And when he heard that, he went home and he did the exact same thing. And of course, he was, they told the king and he was thrown into the lion's den. He had actually given an opportunity, you know, even the, his, his friends who were thrown into the fiery furnace, they were given an opportunity. All you have to do is bow down and worship me, the king was saying, and you can be set free. But they said, no. Actually, they said, no, my God is able to deliver me from this fiery furnace. And then they said this, and even if he doesn't, I will not bow down to you. Well, that's what we need to, this attitude toward worship the enemy. We want to make sure, and you might say, well, pastor, who worships the devil? Well, there's all kinds of people who worship the devil. In this world, I mean, you wouldn't have a church of Satan, which there is, and it's, very, it's alive and well. And that's, that's happening today. There's all kinds of people who make that choice and go that direction. And they refuse to acknowledge Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now, the Apostle Paul, or pardon me, John, talking about heaven, said this in Revelation 21, 27. Talking about heaven. But there shall by no means enter it, that is heaven, anything that defiles 
or cause us an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those will make it into heaven itself. How do you get your name written in the Lamb's book of life? You confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You worship him and him only. You cast off every other God that might have had influence in your life before. You worship the Lord Jesus Christ and him only. Notice it says, but there shall by no means enter heaven anything that defiles or causes an abomination. Anything that defiles. There's a lot of things in this world that defiles. Many, many things in this world that defiles. And actually, we have become so comfortable with some of the things that defile that we just go along with them as if they don't mean anything. We're living in this world that there is, there is so much, uh, so many things of the earth and of the enemy that's influencing us. We've become comfortable and used to them because we've learned to live in them. And one of the uh, best examples of this that I remember of a friend of mine who years ago was in a, uh, actually he was in a service in the U.S. and he was a, a sailor in a submarine, in a nuclear submarine. And this nuclear submarine would go down for underwater and they would not come up for months at a time. It's amazing. He said the longest the time he was down there, I think it was 79 days, underwater for 79 days. And he said, when they came up out of the water and they hit the ocean, in the middle of the ocean, where the air would be, you know, uh, relatively speaking, very clean in the middle of the ocean. But while they were in the submarine under the, under the water, all the air was purified. They made their own air, so it was purified. It was perfect, as perfect as you could get it. And when they came up out of the water and they smelt the ocean air, some of them started puking because there was so much pollution in the air. So much pollution that we've become accustomed to, learned to live with. You see, heaven is a better place. Heaven is a lot better place than even what we think. Heaven is a better place than the best things that this world has to offer. See, we've become, uh, we're, when, we, when we make the transition into heaven, we'll be healed from things we didn't know, even know we needed healing of. I'm convinced of it. There's things that will be just left off us that will say, wow, our, our, even our smell will be heightened. Everything about us will be shifted and changed. How do we make it to heaven? Well, we testify of the Lord. We receive the seal of the Holy Spirit. We testify of him. Our testimony indicates who we belong to. It indicates who uh, is leading us. Our testimony, in a way, when we testify, it's like saying we have this seal upon us when we give testimony to what Jesus has done in our lives. It's, Jesus is looking for his people to testify about him, to talk about the goodness that he has shown them. Actually, Jesus said this very clearly in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. He said, therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my father. Whoever confesses me before men. Daniel was confessing his God before men when he refused to bow to the king. Then he says, but whoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my father in heaven. This confession of faith declares who you belong to. This confession of faith declares who you belong to. If you confess me before men, Jesus said, I will confess you before my Father. I don't know about you, but I want Jesus to mention my name before the throne of God. I want him to mention my name. I want him to be able to say, see that man there? He's confessing my name. He's confessing that he belongs to you. He confesses that he's your child and you're his father. If he confesses me, if I confess before men, he will confess before his father. Glory to God. What about you this morning? Are you in this position where you are confessing the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever stood before men and confessed the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever let others know around you that you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? You've turned to him. You realize that you are a sinner and you needed a savior and Jesus is the savior that you need. Have you ever 
really given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you ever declared that Jesus Christ is Lord before others? John, John said in 1 John 2, 23, whoever denies the Son, the same does not have the Father. He who confesses the Son have the, has the Father. So when we confess Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have the Father also. In Romans chapter 10, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth, or pardon me, with the heart that one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You see, confession is a big deal in the kingdom of God. Confession before men is a big deal before God. Have you confessed Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's the thing this morning. Have you confessed him before men this morning? If you have this desire to confess Christ before men, I want you to stand. Stand.